Tenure officially ending today, Monday, the 10th of October. Now, Mokweng leaves the apex court with a number of vacancies to fill, and it is now up to President Cyril Ramaphosa to choose his successor from a list of eight names submitted after the public was invited to make suggestions. Mokweng's appointment by Jacob Zuma in 2011 saw concerns raised over his relative youth and inexperience, some of his socially conservative judgments, it's been said, and fears that he would perform as a Zuma lackey. To speak about his legacy now is Lawson Naidu, Executive Director, KSAC, and Mbeya Zeli, Benjamin Researcher at organization Judges Matter. Uh, a very good evening to you both, uh, Lawson and Mbeya Zeli. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Let me start with you, Lawson. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of conversation about Mukhoi legacy over the past couple of weeks. Is there anything to your mind that's of great importance that's been overlooked and not been raised in recent discussions? Uh, good afternoon, Sapisa. Thank you very much. Look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it would be fair to say that uh, Chief Justice Mokoi Mokoi's tenure has not been without its successes. And uh, despite the early cynicism and skepticism about his appointment, and, the, and very much about the manner of the appointment that he was the only candidate that appeared to have been considered by former President Zuma, uh, and uh, his name was submitted to the uh, Judicial Service Commission. The fact that uh, the then Deputy Chief Justice, Dikang Mosineke, was overlooked for the job, who, and many, th- many people thought he should have been uh, duly considered. I think despite all of that, uh, certainly for the, for, I would say for the majority of his tenure as Chief Justice, the uh, Chief Justice has done uh, the judiciary proud. He's done well. He uh, initially uh, ran a very collegiate court which, uh, in the height of the Zuma years. Uh, the judiciary as a whole, not just the constitutional court, stood firm against uh, executive uh, uh, transgressions of uh, constitutional principles and responsibilities. Uh, it's, uh, it is unfortunate, however, that he leaves uh, office, having now been on leave for almost five months, under mm. a cloud, uh, you know, with the fact that he was found by the Judicial Service Commission uh, to be in breach of his, uh, you know, of the Judicial Code of Conduct. So he leaves under a crowd, a cloud, and uh, regrettably, that's probably... So, Lusa, we'll get be, to that. Uh, ...his lasting legacy. We'll talk to that abrupt absence in just a moment, but I'd like to hear from you, Mbegazeli, your thought... Uh, about this, uh, said to be the longest serving Chief Justice. Uh, I was asking if there's anything that you feel has not come out in recent discussions that is important. And, and particularly, does the Chief Justice leave the judiciary in a better state than he found it? Um, uh, good evening, Tepiso. Um I echo a lot of what Lawson has said in terms of Ch- uh, Chief Justice Mokweng's legacy being uh, both positive and there were some negative parts. I think one of the, the two key things that will remain uh, f- uh, for the future that uh, Chief Justice Mokweng did was to uh, help establish a, a independent um, a body or authority to run the, the higher courts, which is now called the Office of the Chief Justice. That is a legacy that will remain uh, going forward, where the judiciary now has a separate budget, uh, apart from the Department of Justice, and, and, and that was uh, meant to make sure that the judges are the ones that are running the courts. Another uh, part of his legacy would be um, the the written code of conduct for judges, which didn't exist before and which was a major um, uh, flaw in holding judges accountable. So that was also something that will be a legacy going forward. Um, A third thing would be um, the norms and standards um, to guide court performance. Um, In the past, um, there was no real um, guide or a standard by which we could uh, uh, test how courts are performing. And that was one of the things that uh, Chief Justice Mukwing, um pushed quite strongly, and, and it, it now exists in law. Of course, uh, there are parts of that picture that are still uh, incomplete in terms of how would these institutions um, continue to operate uh, and how have they continued in the latter part of his legacy. And that still remains to be seen because a lot of those projects, unfortunately, they they didn't seem to be as much steam behind them as they were in the earlier years. And then the the other point... You can finish your train of thought. Oh, so yes, I, I was just about to say the, the one other uh, 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 legacy 
um, is is on uh, some of the ways in which the Chief Justice has spoken quite strongly for the judiciary. And I think that is something that future uh, Chief Justices w would emulate. All right. So, uh, Lawson, and uh, because we've just got five minutes left now, I'd like to both uh, as quickly as you can. So you spoke about the cloud that hangs over the Chief Justice's head because of how abruptly he's uh, ended his tenure by taking leave. How much of that takes away the shine from what he's done? And, and, and what do we know about that? I think there's just been a great deal of speculation, Lawson. Lawson, if we can ask you to unmute Sorry. yourself. Um, yeah, he, it is unfortunate that he lives under this cloud. And as I say, you know, it comes on the back of a finding uh, by the JSC that he had breached the uh, Judicial Code of Ethics in his comments on government's policy on uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, he's uh, also made uh, some very controversial remarks about the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and, you know, in those matters, he strayed beyond the judicial realm, as it were, and, uh, and spoke out on issues that uh, a judge perhaps ought not to speak about. And I think uh, the controversial nature of his views has meant that uh, there's been some, uh, you know, it, it has to a certain extent brought him into disrepute mm. and, and as a result brought the judiciary into disrepute. Mm. I think we must also be co cognizant of the fact that in recent months, the judiciary as a whole has come under strong attack from various quarters, uh, in, from politicians and others. And one needed a, a chief justice to be there to stand up to defend the judiciary. And unfortunately, in that regard, Mokweng Mokweng was, was absent uh, on this occasion, although he had done that previously. Mm. And basically, I'd like to talk about that. So in the past, he's been praised uh, since 2015 for really standing up in defense of the judiciary. But as Lawson says, his utterances uh, that have revealed his religious convictions have been looked down upon. How much will this inform choices on the character of his successor and is it fair because on one hand he was thought not to be his own man but by standing by his religious convictions uh, he's then criticized for being his own man too i think uh the the those uh, factors are already coming into the discussion about the new chief justice because one of the uh, qualities um, that we would expect from the chief justice is, is independence and someone who's willing to speak out in favor of the judiciary and who's able to reach out to the executive, to parliament, to try and, and calm the waters in, in, in troubled times. So it's already being a factor um, that uh, Chief Justice Mokhoeng led quite strongly on. And uh, unfortunately, as, as, as Lawson said, some of those comments, yes, were, were, were wrong and were not appropriate for someone who is in that position. But certainly the example of, of speaking quite strongly for the judiciary is one that is that is that we expect that the incoming chief justice will follow. Mm. Lawson, let's look at some of his judgments. Uh, what do you believe changed the judicial landscape here and elsewhere through? Mukweng, uh, Mukweng, and I'm also going to ask you to speak a little bit more about uh, case flow management in relation to our democracy, because that's something that he also committed himself to. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, another significant change that we saw in the, uh, the uh, functioning of the Constitutional Court uh, was the, the, uh, uh, the change that made the Constitutional Court the apex court in all matters and not just in constitutional matters. And that had the result of increasing the workload of the Constitutional uh, Court uh, quite significantly. And given that it's a court that uh, consists of just 11 judges, a minimum of eight of whom must sit on any one case. They can only hear one matter at a time, uh, unlike some, uh, some other courts with, with larger uh, uh, membership. Uh, so that has placed a significant strain on the court itself to, to hear matters, a uh, uh, strain on its case management issues, uh, you know, how quickly they hear matters and how quickly judgments are delivered from that court. They've often found themselves wanting in terms of not delivering uh, judgments within the uh, the guideline uh, uh, time frames, and uh, this is you know obviously a cause frustration for litigants, uh, for the public at large in some of the important cases that come before the court. So you know those are matters that can't be pinned uh, specifically at uh, the Ch Chief Justice Mokweng uh, Mokweng, because you know it's something that that happened. Parliament passed that uh, constitutional amendment, 
without taking into account uh, the capacity of the court to do what the uh, amendment requires of them to do. You know, I think in many respects, uh, you know, one of the last le legacies from a jurisprudential point of view is uh, will be Chief Justice McQueen's, uh, you know, seminal judgment in the Inkandla case, where he, uh, he, he wrote a judgment on behalf of the court, uh, which in one matter, you know, ruled that both the president and the National Assembly had failed to fulfill their constitutional obligations and duties. And that was a, a really far-reaching judgment, and as Mbeki Zeli said earlier, you know, it pointed to his robust independence that he, you know, he was willing to stand up for the, the rule of law, respecting the separation of powers, but applying the constitution in a manner uh, that found that both the executive and parliament uh, had failed. And uh, so I think, you know, he will be remembered for that. And okay. hopefully that is a legacy that we will also reflect on in the years to come. Basically, uh, Chief Justice Mukwe's, um Involvement in relation to South Africa's obligations to other nation states underscored by what is known as the Bashir incident where a warrant of arrest was out for Hassan Omar al-Bashir. Now, how has uh, that shaped the major test of the power of the rule of law on power and politics internally and externally? That was um, another Im Im important moment where the courts had spoken quite clearly that the president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, must be arrested. And the government simply defied that court order. And it, you're quite right, the, the Chief, Chief Justice Mohueng was the one who, st who stood up and spoke quite strongly that court order should be respected and should be enforced. It, it did complicate uh, South Africa's international relations, as the po politicians are saying. But for the rule of law, it was an important moment, not only the judgment itself, but the fact that there was a strong Chief Justice who could speak quite strongly in favor of the court. There was an, an important moment for the rule of law. Okay. Thank you so much to both of you, Lawson Naidu, Executive Director, Kesak and Begazeli, Benjamin, Researcher at Organization Judges Matter. The conversation continues and uh, you can be part of that as well.